Okay, go back to here. So anyway, this uh, this uh, what happened in the past uh, you know past month or so in this area with the uh, computer being made out of carbon nanotube has been a um, pretty exciting result, I would say. Um, the last thing to touch on here is flexible electronics. Yeah, so this is a, a professor at UIUC has been done a lot of nice work with on flexible electronics. If you can make electronics flexible, then they can be placed on things like skin patches. You know, as you can see here, I don't know if you can really see this or not, but there's um, this is actually placed directly on skin. That's skin underneath there. So this is what they call an electronic tattoo. Um, the, the electronics are so thin that it can be made into a, like literally a tattoo that is almost adhered to the skin. And uh, some of these designs are antenna designs that allows you to uh, transmit wireless information. So for example, you could make an EKG type device which is like use ele uses electrical leads to detect heart rate and um, then transmit that information through these um, antennas that are built in here. These, this is about the size of a postage, postage stamp. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, this is another example of cool things you can do if you can make electronics uh, flex, uh, flexible. You can uh, bend it into a, an eyeball-like shape. Uh, and there's a company, at least there was like several years ago, there's a company called Second Sight that was developing a um, basically a camera that goes into your eyeball to help um, to re provide a prosthetic for people who are blind. I don't know how well the company's doing right now or if they're still in existence, but um, this is the type of technology that allows you to do some really neat stuff like that. Uh, these are other examples of electronics that are fabricated on, on flexible substrates. So um, in some cases you, take, you can take a brittle material and put it on a flexible printed circuit board. So the circuit board itself bends, but the, the actual electronic piece does not. And then there's these new materials like graphene where the electronics themselves can bend um, easily. And those materials, I would say, really are game changers. Uh, there's other areas that solid state electronics plays an important role. Um, I'm just giving you a little bit about like what my lab does. We've been developing like um, like a wearable heart rate sensor. I actually have uh, actually have one of these things with me here. If anyone is interested in seeing, yeah, I'll pass this around. So we're, we're developing a. Uh, a heart rate sensor that you wear on the ear like this. It goes like this. <laughs> so this is made on a, um, you know, on silicon. You can see how small the electronics are in the front and the back. Um, this is using like stuff that's commercially available right now. So I wouldn't say that these are um, these are new electronic materials by any means. So I guess the only point I'm trying to make in this particular slide is that um, that. Uh, Things like these, and you can you can open it. And look. A lot of devices, a lot of wearable devices that we have, a lot of like what they say IoT type devices, where we have sensors everywhere, we have Wi-Fi everywhere, we have computers and phones everywhere, and they have so many sensors and information gathering devices in there. They're all because of um, you know solid state. You know, they're all made of silicon essentially. That particular device that we're working on, it has a sensor that we that we uh, um, repurposed for doing heart rate sensing. It's all, it's all made of silicon. Um, the wireless transmitter that you see on the back, Bluetooth, it's made of silicon. Um, the, the only thing that's, uh, that doesn't use silicon directly is the, the accelerometer, the, the activity tracker that's on there. That activity tracker is based on MEMS technology. It's actually a little moving part in there that detects acceleration. So that, that, that little earring thing can actually detect um, uh, heart rate, motion, and skin temperature. And so we're developing like uh, these types of wearables for doing patient monitoring and, uh, and um, we're trying to commercialize an application where you use it for fitness monitoring type applications. So uh, going on to here, along those lines, uh, I tried this once as an exercise, but we, we can just, in the interest of time, we can just have a quick discussion on this. Uh, 
This question was, how many smartphone components does your smartphone, how many semiconductor components does your smartphone have? And the reason this discussion is relevant is because almost all these semiconductor components are made from some type of semiconductor material. So many components in your phone are made from semiconductor materials. So let's start with the most important ones. Um, we all love taking pictures, right? So as you know, um, the uh, all the imagers that are used in cell phones, they're all made of silicon, right? We went over that like you know four or five slides earlier. This silicon, uh, you have this like active pixel array. Light hits part of this part of the substrate. It generates uh, electrons and holes. Those things are stored as charge. And then that charge is read out using using an uh, an onboard amplifier, and so it's able to detect the amount of light in all the pixels that are on the sensor. Typical sensors now are like you know anywhere between five megapixel all the way up to like twenty megapixel in the professional grade you know type of cameras. So we know that's made of silicon. What what else is made of silicon? Yeah, Dave. question on the cameras. Um, yeah. So because there's two things, right? There's intensity and then there's color. So yeah. does it first capture a certain pixel? Does it capture the wavelength and then great question somewhere interprets the intensity? Yeah, great question. The the question was how how does it interpret the color of the light? It's, it's obviously interpreting the intensity of the light, but as David said, like the color is also really important. The way they get color is they add a color filter on top of the sensor. So, so the, two sensors. No, no, no. There's one sensor, but they have something called a Bayer filter that goes on top of the sensor. So it's, it's basically like one pixel will be covered with the red filter that only allows red light to come through. The pixel next to it will be covered with the green filter that only allows green light to come through. And the one next to that will only allow blue light to come through. So you have certain pixels which detect red light, certain pixels which detect green, and certain pixels which detect blue. If you can detect red, green, and blue light, those are the three colors that you need to make a full color image. So is it like a 10 megapixel camera really has 30 megapixels? It's it's like that, yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah, yeah. so, so if they say, it, it, the, I'm giving you a very simple answer, but Fair the enough. reality is it's a little bit more complicated. Let's say you have let's say you have a ten um, a ten megapixel sensor, right? So that means you have ten million pixels. So, but um, the ten million pixels, they have either they're either an R, G, or B pixel, one of the one of the three. Okay, but um, what they do is they they take neighboring pixels and they do some kind of interpolation, so you still end up with 10 megapixel resolution. But it's cheating. It's cheating because you're not actually getting true 10 megapixel resolution at, in all three colors. Yeah, okay. Right. So yeah, you're right. If, if, you were to, you know, if you were to play fairly, then a 10 megapixel sensor would actually have something like more, in, a 10 megapixel color sensor would actually only have like two and a half megapixel uh, resolution because they have, they arrange the color grid in a four, four color space, or not four color space. They have three different colors, RGB, but one of the colors is actually used twice so that they're arranged in that, like, you know, you have four color, uh, color filters next to each other and that's just a repeat, that pattern is just repeated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're interested in imaging, like imaging is really a really cool area of, of, uh, um, uh, of semiconductors and, uh, you know, that's something you could explore in your uh, in your projects. Yeah. There's actually some kind of weird offset that's in there that our, the human eye just doesn't detect because it's too small. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let, let me, you know what, there, there seems to be some interest in this. So why don't we, you know, I'm actually going to show you, just look at, do a Google search on uh, Bayer filter. Um, look at a picture of it. This is what a Bayer filter looks like. Your, uh, this is your imager. Sorry. Let's make this bigger. A Bayer filter mosaic oh, is a color That's not what I wanted. <laughs> this, uh, this filter, this pattern of um, little colors are placed on top of the CMOS sensor that only allows certain colors to pass through. And you notice that it, it's, in, it's in this pattern. There's green, red, and blue. But you see a lot more green, uh, you see a lot more green than you see red and blue, right? So they have like some mathematical algorithm that they use to figure out what the art, uh, what the color is at every single pixel. 
So at every single pixel, you get an R, G, and B value. But they cheat because what they do is they look at this pixel in order to get the, this pixel, the, the one I'm pointing at right now, just has red on top of it, right? So you can't get red, green, and blue values on that pixel directly. The way you get the green and blue values at this pixel is that you look at the neighboring pixels and you do some kind of interpolation. You might not have the answer for this, but is green the majority because its wavelength is in between red and blue? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There, there was a reason why they use uh, more green than the other ones. But uh, let's get back to this. Like, the, what are the other components? Let, let's just see if we can name a few of them. I think you know we're not going to try to get an exhaustive list here, but just just a just a few. The motherboard, yeah, the, the motherboard and the main microprocessor, of course, is made out of silicon. In fact, very high density, you know, very high density transistor counts because these processors, as I mentioned, they have there's more processing power in a in a typical phone than than the mainframes had back in the '60s. What else? The touch screen. The touch screen. The touch screen. Yeah, made up of display technologies, semiconductor displays. You've heard of OLED. Yeah. OLED displays, AMOLED displays, which are all the rage right now. They're all semiconductor uh, devices that are, um, they're semiconductors that are direct band gap that can emit light. And some of the OLEDs, if you've seen like curved, curved displays, curved TVs, you know, they're also bendable. What else? Memory. Gesture control. Gesture control. So gesture control sensors are accelerometers. They can detect motion and tilt. Those are actually MEMS devices. They actually have small moving parts in them. But the readout circuits for those MEMS devices are all like they're all analog and mixed signal circuits, all done in silicon. How about communication? Antenna. Antennas are made out of, they're just made out of metal. But what about the circuits that read the antenna? The radio transceiver circuits. They call them transceivers because they transmit and they receive. The radio transceiver circuits in these cell phones are all made of silicon. They used to be uh, made of like uh, you know materials like gallium arsenide, which have like faster mobilities. Um, they were, they, but um, now they're able to make them from silicon, and that's the reason why you know these phones have become so cheap recently. Um, in addition to uh, like radio communications for the the cell network, there's also Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi parts, uh, Wi-Fi wi transceivers also. Uh, uh, operate on silicon. Um, there's a bunch of other sensors in there too. Like uh, there's a sensor that detects when you put the phone in your pocket and it turns the screen off. Those are made from uh, from silicon. Memory. Memory is another big one. Memories are made from silicon. So you know tons of components. Uh, the majority of the components in your cell phones are all silicon based. All right, so, uh, you know, to summarize this module, you know, uh, taking a class in solid state electronics in some ways is preparing yourself for the future of electronics. It's not just about the devices that we're going to study in this class. We're only going to be looking at like three of the historic devices like MOSFETs, BJTs, diodes that have been around for decades. But um, the, the point is just to learn the basic intuitions and skills so that they can be applied to some of these emerging and new devices. So the ways to keep um, up to date on this field uh, is to look at you know, some of the journals, um, the Journal on Solid State and Electron Devices, Journal of Solid State Circuits. Um, there's a conference called the International Electron Devices Meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, transactions on industrial electronics and nowadays a lot of these the stuff that was used to be published in just electronics journals are, are published in the mainstream science journals because of the importance of electronics in today's science and technology like so the, they're published in things like nature nanotechnology nature electronics um, advanced electronic materials and so on another great place to um, a read up on the field in fact I would recommend this first is um, places like IEEE Spectrum, MIT Tech Review, uh, EE Times. These are all just like websites that just post the latest and greatest of what's happening in the world of semiconductors. That um, the article about the carbon nanotube computer, I, I got that. I get emails from IEEE Spectrum, so that's where I found out about that. So.
those are ways to keep uh, current on the field, and it's also you know it's a lot of fun to be able to see what the what the latest and greatest stuff is. So, any questions about this stuff? Any questions? All right.